idea of losing one's memory is a horrifying one for anyone. Certainly for anyone who has witnessed a loved one succumb to dementia, to see them gradually lose their sense of the past and then the present. I don't have to tell you how horrifying that is. But something else happens when you witness that experience. You think about yourself, and you wonder, what would it be like if I lost my own memory? And more specifically, I think you wonder, would I know it's happening? Would I, would I realize that I was losing my memory, and would I feel like there was anything I could do about it? So I think that memory is to us as individuals what history is to us as, as a society. I, th I think that we understand who we are as, part, as being part of a bigger group, and that's a group with a connected past that's true for our identity as a nation, as a community, as a family. It's even true for our identity as a sports fan with an allegiance to a particular team. So, I, I think a lot about history. I am a professional historian. I have a PhD in US history. So I think about how we teach history, how we learn it, how it uh, affects who we are as individuals and as groups. But I'm, I'm also a technologist uh, and an entrepreneur, so I don't work on the academic side of history. I work with the organizations that store and share our historical record to help them build better solutions uh, to connect the public with the stories that they protect. And I do this because I believe history is incredibly important to us as a society, and I believe that we are unknowingly letting it slip away. So as a historian, I have access to this mostly unseen world, this world that contains the bulk of the information that we use to tell stories about the past. These are our primary sources, our documents, images, objects, a variety of materials that we use. Now, for centuries, archivists have carefully preserved our historical materials in archives. They've developed sophisticated cataloging systems so that we can locate materials uh, when we need them. As a society, we've made this investment for centuries because on a certain level, we know how important it is. Even if we don't interact with the materials directly, we know that without the information in these places, that serves as evidence of a sort, without this information, people in the future could simply make up whatever they wish to be true about the past. But here's the problem. We don't go to places like this anymore for information. We don't go to archives. We certainly don't use card catalogs because we live in the digital age. And in the digital age, we mainly access information through the click of a mouse. So I know there are many terms for digital natives, younger people. <laughs> I like to call uh, that generation of people that's, that has grown up accessing information this way, anyone under the age of, say, 20 or so, I call them generation click. Because to generation click, the world is digital. They run searches online, and they form opinions and interpretations based on the information that they receive. Now, those of us who are only, you know, slightly older than Generation Click, um, we understand this on a certain level. We understand that, that we now access information differently. Um, but I, I don't think that we fully understand how profoundly that truth will affect our future. And I think that's because we have an experience, a recollection, of accessing information another way. So 
It's likely been a while since we cracked open a Britannica, but we, we have the recollection of information being made available someplace else. We live at a transition between one era and the next, where we used to do things one way, and now we do things another. But Generation Click didn't used to do something another way. For them, the world is digital. Here's this other thing about Generation Click and all who come after them. They assume when they search for information online that they are searching the world of information. And in fact, they are searching the world of information that has been made available to them in such a way that a search engine can find. So in many cases, that information is a minuscule percentage of the information that's out there. So if we will only access information online through web searches, what does that mean for the vast majority of our historical information that still lives in places that look like this? There are our political papers, our records, wrapped up, rolled up maps or films stuck in archives. If we believe, as we have for centuries, that, that these materials hold value. If we believe that they'll continue to hold value in the future, then it's absolutely critical that they get moved to the digital in order to remain relevant. And the organizations that house this history, so those are, are our libraries, our museums, our historical societies, those organizations that fail to effectively make that transition, they risk becoming obsolete. And then there's the very real possibility that a sizable portion of our history could become invisible. Um, so I'm here today to say that we are not doing that. We are not effectively making the transition of the vast majority of our historical record from the physical to the digital. And perhaps more alarmingly, in many cases where we think we're doing it, we aren't doing it correctly. I believe that this is a result of uh, our general lack of understanding about how search engines work and our acceptance um, that, that that knowledge, the understanding of how search engines work, that that is actually critical to our forming a new way of cataloging our historical record. So how do search engines work? I like to think about the World Wide Web and all of the information that it contains. I like to think of it on one level like Velcro, because to me, Velcro is magical, right? <laughs> it's just magic. One side sticks to the other, it's brilliant. <laughs> the internet, I can search something, it's there, it's brilliant. But of course, when you look closely at Velcro, you see a more sophisticated network of loops and hooks, where one side has carefully formed loops that get attached to the hooks to make one side magically stick to the other. So the side of Velcro that is, is uh, full of loops over there, that's the sea of information we put online. And when we put information online, if it doesn't have loops that the hooks, which would be the search engine, or the, the search engines online that send out those hooks, if they don't have loops to attach to, then one side doesn't stick to the other and magic doesn't happen. So if that's just a flat surface, it doesn't work. So what does that mean? It means that we have to be careful and intentional about how we funnel this world of historical information onto the web. We have to be careful and intentional. We cannot simply scan materials and put them online because there are no loops. They, that doesn't mean anything to a search engine. So anything that we would scan or otherwise image and put online, 
we need to tag it with a series of terms or loops that a search engine can hook into. So the same way that you tag your friends' names and photos on Facebook, that allows you to kind of instantly grab any photo that's attached to a particular name. The same thing holds true of our historical materials. So our digitized historical images need information like names and places and dates in order to be found through the web. But that's still really only the first layer. Because if you think about it, if I search for information online, if I search someone's name, I already know that that person exists. So I'm looking to see what's out there about something. We have to get much more detailed at the level of information we're recording for, for search engines to find meaningful results. And interestingly, it's even more true when we think about historical documents because we have a misconception that documents are more findable online because they have text. When in fact, the, the text that's the content of a document is rarely going to translate to some sort of meaningful search tag. So we need subject tags that are attached to every historical record we place online in order for them to be found through different kinds of online searches. So in this example, we have our Emancipation Proclamation. This is the document in which Abraham Lincoln declared that all slaves shall be free. It's an important document from our past. And it exists digitally online. So now and in the future, we can go and find it and read through it and come to our own conclusions about what it means. You can find it if you search for Emancipation Proclamation. So if you know it exists, you can find it. You likely will get there eventually by searching for Abraham Lincoln. But what we want is a world in which future searchers get to this sort of material when they're searching subjects, when they're interested in subjects like the history of slavery in the United States, when they're interested in what declarations were made during the Civil War, or the experiences of black soldiers in the Civil War. We need that level of detail uh, for people to find these materials through a meaningful search. So, you may be thinking, I can already do that, right? I can search for anything, anything, right? World War I, history of women in voting, anything I think of, I'm gonna be able to, I'm gonna get search results. It's very rare that, that you get absolutely nothing. That's true, and that's, that's progress. We have a greater access, we have access to a greater amount of information. But we know, because I've showed you rooms full of dusty old boxes, that it's still only a fraction of what's actually out there. But more importantly, what you discover when you search online for historical information are summaries. What's returned to you are summaries of what people like me with PhDs and others put up there. They're summaries of interpretations of the historical material. That's fine. But that's all you get for the most part. So what we're doing right now is we are preserving our current presentations of history. But we are failing to preserve history itself. Because history itself still lives in places like this. We have not effectively moved it to the place where we now and will continue to access information. So in my view, we as a society are at that moment. We are at that moment when we risk losing our memory, our collective memory in our historical sources. But the good news is that there is something we can do about it. We can choose to prioritize making these materials actually preserved digitally and meaningfully for the long term, for the future. And I realize that the story I'm telling about this potential future is a scary one. I think it's a scary one. But it's only one side of the story because I believe that we will step up. I believe that we will, as a society, choose to prioritize this effort. And when we do, I think something 
even more exciting and more profound will happen. We will have the peace of knowing our history is preserved for the future. But the promise of the digital age is that more information is available to more people, that we can create a true democracy of information. So a future in which people can search not only summer, uh, summaries, but actual, actual sources, that's an exciting one. And that, that we can truly create that democracy of information, I, I believe that we can do that as soon as we truly invest in the, um, in the future of history. Thank you.